All right, hi. I have three parts in my talk. The first one is why would you want to build your own language? The second part is building a little language. And the third part then is a couple of lessons learned we learned from uh, building languages. Lots of stuff, not enough time. I'll speak quickly and you ask questions quickly at the end. We'll get this done somehow. All right, so motivation. You've probably uh, seen uh, business people say something like this. You know, I've just written those requirements and now I have to explain them for three months to the technical guys to implement it and they'll get it wrong anyway. And then, of course, the technical people are also frustrated because they get these imprecise Word documents with stuff in it and they don't really know how to implement it. But they're responsible if it fails, right? It's always their fault or our fault as developers. So that's bad. There's also the other direction where the IT guys decide that they have to re-implement whatever application in a new, in, on, on some new technology, you know, mobile, microservice, whatever thing. Um, and so the business people have to again talk to those guys and explain to them what the application actually does again. So that's annoying, but of course the technical guys have to do this because they are hype driven, as we all are, and so we have to redo everything every few years in a new technology. So how can we make that problem less annoying? Well, we should be able to somehow decouple Fachlichkeit and technology. Notice Fachlichkeit, if you're German, you're probably not surprised about this word. If you speak English natively, this is our attempt to you know, do a kindergarten. Um, because there is no word in English that represents Fachlichkeit precisely. If you translate it, you get professionalism, which is completely not fitting. Fachlichkeit is the non-technical core of your system, the, the thing that's relevant to your domain, right? The, the actual business knowledge or whatever. So Fachlichkeit, nice word. So you want to represent that in a way so that it is independent of a particular technology. You want to represent it in a way that it's precise slash formal enough so it can be directly tested, analyzed, executed, simulated. And you want to represent it in a way that, well, with a language that is friendly, so your, you know, these people here, you know, they can directly write and work with this kind of stuff and not just the technical guys. So that's the idea, right? You build a domain-specific language that is formal, that is checkable, and that is understandable by those people. And then they can directly implement systems by writing code in that language. And I'm putting quotation marks around all of these things because I don't know what, the, what we should use as a word, right? I don't want to call it code because then those guys get scared. I don't want to call it programming, but if I call it modeling, everybody thinks of boxes and lines. So it's, it's, it's a, a tough wording problem. Maybe we should call it Fachlichkeiting, but then it's even worse than. Whatever. So how does this work conceptually? And I'll get more concrete in a moment. So you have the business guy. He creates models, specifications, Fachlichkeit things, um, different ones for different aspects of a system. And they do that by using languages tailored for these different aspects. They are implemented by the software guy, right? And then, of course, you need tools that allow you to implement languages. These are then meta-languages or language workbenches, and those are implemented by strange people, right? Uh, because they have to work on meta-meta level. Um, I know some of them, they don't all look like this, but it's a reasonably close approximation. So the language workbench I like to use is MPS, open source stuff from JetBrains. I'll show that in a moment. So, I'm going to show you a few examples that maybe hopefully drive home why you would want to do this. So here is, uh, oh, sorry, German. Um, this is a representation of, an insur of a part of an insurance product. And this looks like a Word document. And the reason why it looks like a Word document is that in, a, like in the old system, it actually was a Word document, which was then uh, transferred into a uh, transfer format, PDF, uh, shipped to some cheap uh, you know, implementation place. And then people implemented all of this stuff manually. Interesting, you can see here that these pseudo code things actually, no, they're not. In the original system, they were actually German. So you wondered how these people at the other end of the world would actually understand this, but whatever. So obviously, this is not a very like streamlined process. And so we were tasked to build a domain specific language that tried to look as much as possible as the original Word document thing. 
but still is formal enough to be executable. And so here you can see parameter declarations. You can actually see code that runs this whole table thing. It's essentially a case statement, right? So there are different cases, and then this is what's executed. And it also mixes um, you know, textual descriptions, and it, it really looks like a Word document. And so that's a, an example of one particular DSL. And of course, the, the, the idea of making it look friendly to, to the main expert has been driven to some kind of extreme, right? You don't have to do it that badly, right? Um, here is another example, um, calculating public benefits in a German context. I mentioned that because I have another context later. Um, and you can see there's a mix between almost like form, style, and language, right? So these, these bold things, they are kind of always there. You can't remove them like in a normal text editor. They're, they're like projected as a template into which you put your code. And then you can put expressions here with like any other language. Um, and so one problem that we found with domain experts is that they don't like the empty paper effect, right? You give them an empty file into which they can put their code. Not a good idea. You have to guide people. And you can do that by you know, giving a form style thing into which they can then fill in code in, in various places. This is just a random example of a, a graphical notation for a functional programming language just to illustrate, yes, you can also do graphics. It's surprisingly rare. I mean, useful. People don't want that much. They rather prefer tables, uh, math, symbols, stuff like that. But the occasional graphical diagram, for example, for data modeling, of course, makes sense. Um, here is a weird example. It is used to specify the rules that go into tachographs, Fahrtenschreiber in German and perhaps Dutch, I don't know. Um, so if you drive a truck, there are all these rules when you have to take breaks. And these rules are A, non-trivial, and B, different in every European country, let alone outside of the EU. And if you're a manufacturer of these tachographs, you have to describe these rules somehow. And our customer uh, built a prototype language in, I guess you can guess which tool they built a prototype in, right? Excel, like everybody does everything in Excel. And so we've built a very custom notation. This is a notation for the language that looks like no other DSL because we try to replicate Excel, but there is a type system behind it. There is a structure behind it. These different borders, if you will, have semantic meaning. You can embed uh, C code, and then from that we generate the firmware that actually runs on the tachograph. And so this is a very efficient way to manage all these rules. These are just two random examples to show that we can use mathematical notations. And this is a, a short function, recursive function style for uh, insurance math. Um, click, click. This is an example that uh, I guess needs some stylistic polishing in terms of the language, but it's used to describe or actually implement satellite onboard software so that the software that controls the you know, thermal management, energy management, scheduling of various tasks on a satellite. Um, that's part of the implementation here. Uh, and this is an example from healthcare where doctors and other medical professionals encode algorithms for diagnosing various you know, effects. Well, I shouldn't say various, I shouldn't say diagnosing illnesses. As part of a therapy, they, they essentially track the progress and then you know, identify whether you should take this pill or that pill or you know, measure your temperature at this or that time or have more breakfast or a certain diet and in the worst case, tell you to call your doctor, right? So the idea was to have uh, doctors directly code these algorithms in this language. It relies heavily on decision trees and decision tables. And then, of course, they can also write tests to, if you will, simulate a whole treatment for a given patient. That was a very interesting project because if you know anything about healthcare, you might know that in order to do this, like build such applications that do these kind of treatment um, support thing. You have to get a stamp from the FDA, Food and Drug Administration in the US. And um, it's not so obvious how you get DSLs and code generation and all of this kind of certificated by the FDA. But uh, there's a two-phase pro process we've, well, our customer has successfully gone through the first phase. So we are extremely confident that this thing will get the stamp. So that's very interesting. So there's a source and paper that we recently wrote um, which you can either somehow rescue from behind the paywall, or you can find a draft, uh, as it happens, on my website. 
Anyway, so this was the motivation why you would want to do this. DSLs, if you do them right, allow you to um, really integrate stakeholders, domain experts into the software development process directly as opposed to just writing documents and then hoping for the best. Um, all of these examples I gave were built with MPS. MPS is a language workbench, right? A tool for building languages. It's open source, so everything I've shown, um, well, I mean, the language is, of course, proprietary to your customers, right? But the, the tooling to do all this is all open source. Um, there are some aspects of the languages, for example, the tables and the diagrams that are not directly part of MPS. They're part of a, if you will, extension library, but that's also open source, so there's no catch. Um, to what I'm talking about here. Um, I think, personally, that MPS is the most powerful example of a language workbench. Of course, I'm a little bit biased. Um, well, you could say I only use it because it's the best, right? I mean, there's always this causality in both directions. But it's extremely powerful, and um, it has been used for 10 years. My team at ITIM has spent the last 10 years doing nothing else. Um, and while it still has its quirks and rough edges, I guess, I mean, it's 15 years of development history, you know, embedded in it. Uh, it's extremely powerful and highly recommended to, to use. Um, here are a couple of companies that, that use MPS in production. You might recognize those guys if you're Dutch. So your taxes and your benefits, in case you get uh, some, are calculated based on a rule set that is described and implemented and tested and debugged with MPS. So the Dutch tax agency has a, has a language engineering team for years, actually, like for 20 years they've done this, and a few years ago they've ported everything from their own proprietary solution to MPS, and uh, so it's really interesting what's going on there. I mean, if you want to see this stuff used really for, absolutely for real, you should talk to those guys. So they had, well, they should tell the anecdotes. It's really interesting. Um, language Workbench, as I said, allows you to define essentially all aspects of a language, structure, syntax, notation, type system, code generators, interpreters, everything that you need to make the language, and of course the IDE, everything you need to make the language like, useful to, to real people. And uh, what is interesting in MPS in particular is that it supports all these different notations. You've seen many of them in my examples. And it also supports language modularity, so you can have a language that has modular extensions. We spent uh, three years between 20, actually two years in a research project and a few more years after that, uh, building something called Embedder, which is a bunch of extensions to C to make it more useful for embedded programming. You can also do embedding, where you have uh, one DSL embedded in another one, but not like they do in Scala or Groovy or Ruby by using reflection and metaprogramming, by, but by actual, like, language definition with type system and everything. It's extremely powerful. In particular, it allows us to use this pattern here, where a domain-specific language is often structured in these three layers. At the core, you have a functional language with expressions, uh, primitive types, values, things like functions, option types, you know, the, the stuff you know from any modern language. But then you build domain-specific behaviors around it and domain-specific data structures on top of it. Like, for example, an insurance contract could be a domain-specific structure. It has rules inside of it that execute in a, like any rule engine, but then at the core you have these functional expressions. We've built a language called kernel F, uh, like kernel as in core, and F like functional, that uh, is intended to be used here. And essentially all of the languages we've built over the last few years embed this language. So now, we're, let's move to the demo. And actually what we're going to do is we're going to make a little extension to kernel F because it doesn't make a lot of sense to, you know, do a whole domain analysis and try to explain the, the you know, intricacies of a particular domain. So what you see here um, is a little bit of code in kernel F. You can define a function. It takes two arguments. The first one is a number between 0 and 100. We do range checking for numbers in the type system here uh, and a string. And then it has an if expression and says, if the number here is bigger than 10, then you return greetings, comma, string, else you return an empty string. So you can run this in the built-in interpreter, right? And if you pass 20, then you get the greeting. If you pass 10, you get nothing, right? And now my idea is to just to show you how all of this works, to build a, a modular language extension that essentially does exactly the same as the if but it's different, right? And we just re-implement the if as a modular extension, and we use Dutch keywords. 
um, just because uh, keywords in any language other than uh, English are extremely weird, but why not? Um, so we want to write here something like als blah, 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 done, blah, 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 unders, right? That's, I think, what it would be called in Dutch, right? If then else, als dann anders, right? Okay, so Google Translate did a good job. Um, so I already prepared an empty new language and an empty new solution where I will put the interpreter to make all of this run. Um, I did that because it's boring, right? You just use a bunch of menu items to create new languages and stuff, so I don't have to show this here. We're out of time anyway. So let's create a new language concept, which I'll call the als, als done unders expression, right? Everything is an expression in kernel F because it's a functional language, mostly. So, OK, I can do this. Now, the way you build something that is modular but can still be used in another language is you use simple object-oriented polymorphism, right? So you know that here uh, kernel F expects expressions because kernel F expect, expects expressions essentially everywhere. So in order to, to make the Alstan anders thing be able to plug here, you have to inherit from expression, simple object orientation, right? So I put expression here, but, uh, caps shit, expression, expression isn't visible. Why? Well, I've just defined a new language that has no relationship to any other language, so I can't inherit from the expression concept that comes from the kernel F language, right? It's not visible. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that my new language here extends the expression language, that the language that defines expressions in kernel F, and that language is uh, blah, 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 core base. Um, here, uh, this is actually the package where the kernel F expression lives for historic reasons. It's called IATS3. That was the name of the research project. It's a shitty name, but we'll change that at some point. Um, actually, something that MPS isn't very good at is renaming languages. So that's why it still has this name. So, and I say I'm going to extend this language which allows me to put expression here as something from which I inherit. And why doesn't it work? So this is, uh, careful, this is expression from base language, right? Base language is uh, JetBrains' version of Java. It also has an expression. If I make my thing inherit from this one, then that's the wrong expression. So uh, I'm actually slightly surprised why I don't see, ah, uh, yeah, because it's the wrong language. Core expression base, that's the one. You notice that I didn't explicit, explicitly uh, extend the MPS base language. So I think it's a bug that it's visible here. JetBrains thinks it's a feature. We couldn't agree. Um, maybe you can vote somewhere for something. All right, so now we have the als done anders expression. And I want to, uh, the, 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 the syntax for that thing, for now, I'll just define it as als, which is like the leading keyword, right? So I go into the editor definition and define an editor, which is just ALS. I'm compiling, compiling this thing, so now we generate a language implementation, which is Java code that's then dynamically loaded from MPS. And I can now go into my example program here, and what should I be able to do? Can I use the ALS? No. Oh, yes. Oh, I already have the import. All right. I wanted to make this point that um, you can only use a language extension if you import that particular new language into your program, right? And it seems I forgot to delete that particular import after I did my test run. Yeah, there is the language already. So that shouldn't have been there for demo purposes. And now I would have edited, right? It's already there. OK, so anyway, I can put the alts here. Um, not surprising, also not very useful, but it kind of structurally works. So how does the alts done unders thing look structurally? in terms of syntax tree. What other children does this thing have? Well, it has a condition, right, which is the expression, exactly one. And then we have the then part, that would be the done, right? So I'm going all out on Dutch here, right? I'm not only going to make the concrete syntax Dutch, but also the names of the language definition elements. So that's going to be very sophisticated. So 
That's probably another expression. And then the unders, right? Also an expression. Okay. So how does the editor look? Well, the editor simply puts these things into a collection, right? So als, and then I embed the condition. Uh, that's not very Dutch, I just noticed. Um, then the keyword done, and I put the expression that represents the then part, and I put the unders keyword and the remaining expression, okay? I'm compiling this, going back to the example, and you can see that the existing code changed how it looked. Why is that? Well, MPS uses a projectional editor. You don't type stuff, which is then parsed into a tree and then processed. Rather, every editing activity directly changes the tree. And then there is a projection engine, almost like a model view controller thing, that shows it in whatever editor you define. And if you already have an instance of something in your tree and you change the editor, well, then you change the look of existing programs. Whether this is good or bad depends on what you do with it, right? Um, but that's how it works. So I can now put code here, like for example, uh, a plus three, then uh, I think we can already do something useful, greeting plus s, else an empty string. You notice that we can already put all expressions that are already there in this language here, right? So we just said that the condition, then, and else part of our new language concept are expressions, any expression. So I can already use the argument reference expression or the plus expression here without any other thing. Notice that these come from a different language, right? So I've already done two kinds of composi compositions. I've embedded my new thing into kernel F, and I've used stuff from kernel F, which I've then embedded into my new thing without any parser ambiguity issues or something. So structurally, this looks good. But of course, from a type system perspective, that's wrong, because we expect this to be Boolean. And we didn't say that anywhere. So we don't get an error right now. So we can put the plus, and nobody cares. I mean, the type system doesn't care. So let's fix that, right? So we're going to go into the language definition again and add a type system rule, an inference rule for the als dann anders expression. And we say that the type of the als dann anders expression's condition must be Boolean. Now, there is a little. Uh, Particularity about kernel F, which is that it has replaceable primitive types. You can plug in your own primitive types, domain-specific primitive types, into the existing expression language. And that's why I'm not just like writing an instance of the uh, Boolean type here, but I'm actually going to use the primitive type factory. And I ask it to create a Boolean type. But what this is here is an equation, right? It says, for the type system to be correct, the type of the condition must be the same or a subtype of the kind of literal Boolean type. OK? So let's see if this works. Going back here, press F5 to re-trigger the type system, and now I get an error, right? And interestingly, it already figured out that the type of this thing here is uh, a number between 2 and 102, because it knows that the A is between 0 and 100, and if I add 2, it's going to be a differently uh, structured interval. We don't do this static range calculation for every program because that would require a fully dependent type system, which is uh, slightly beyond uh, my capabilities. But we do it for enough stuff to be useful. All right, so let's change this to uh, this. And of course, to replicate the example from above, we should put a uh, 10 here. Okay? Okay, so we have made progress. Uh, what else do we see here? We see that a stupid error message, which essentially says you haven't calculated a type for the whole als then otherwise expression, right? So it doesn't have a type. So it can't check whether the type of this whole thing somehow fits to the type of the function if there were one def defined, right? I can make the uh, type explicit here. And now it's trying to uh, check whether this type is um, whether this type is a subtype of string. But I didn't say anything about how the type of the whole expression derives from other types, right? So let's, let's fix that. Let's go back to our typing thing here. And I'm going to write the code, then I'll explain it. So I'm going to declare a type system variable. I'm going to express that t 
is a super type of the type of the expressions done part. And I'm going to do the same for the unders part. And then I'm going to say type of the whole thing is t. So what does this do? I said before, this is a actual, you specify equations, right? This is not an assignment or, an, or a test. This is an equation, a set of equations that goes into a solver, which then tries to figure out the type system's correctness. So what I'm going to say here, what I'm saying here is I'm defining a variable t, and I express that this variable t must be the same or a super type of the done part. And it must also be, it's just a second constraint, must also be uh, the same or a super type of the otherwise part. So in other words, to satisfy both of these, t must be uh, the common supertype of the done and the unders expressions, right? And if they're the same, then it's just that same type. And then I'm essentially saying that the type of the whole expression is exactly that computed type t. So let's compute, uh, compile, press F5 once, and everything's fine because this is now type string because the common supertype of that thing and that thing is, surprise, surprise, string. OK? OK, good. So let's see what the tests say. OK, uh, we could look up what actually the test says. The test says that there is an exception uh, falling, uh, being thrown, because I haven't yet implemented an interpreter for this thing here. Right? So it doesn't know how to actually execute this. Right? This is only code and a static type check, but there's no execution semantics defined so far. In MPS, by default, you define semantics through generation. So for example, you could generate all of this stuff to Java and then run Java program. And in fact, we do have a Java generator for this kernel F language, because for deployment purposes, when you deploy this thing for real, it's usually some kind of Java server backend thing. We also have a TypeScript uh, uh, generator almost finished, so you can deploy it into the browser. And more interestingly, in my opinion, we have this interpreter framework where you can run these things directly in the IDE, which allows your domain expert, when they write code in a DSL, to directly play with it, execute it directly in the tool. So you have like a zero turnaround time without any deployment shit for the domain person. OK, so let's implement the interpreter. Um, we have an interpreter framework here that allows us to do that. So we have the um, ALS expression here. And so this interpreter works by essentially uh, mapping a piece of syntax tree to uh, a piece of code written in Java. So the, like the, 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 the way to define the semantics of your DSL, in this case, is to write Java code that does whatever the thing is supposed to do. So let's write this Java code. So the first thing we have to do is we have to execute, we have to evaluate the, the condition, right? So we can do this by, by calling the interpreter recursively on the uh, uh, node dot condition. So this hash is a shortcut for calling the interpreter again with this new node. Because you do that all the time, it's good to have a shortcut. So from, that, uh, from this comes back a Java object, and because we are uh, there's no reason to be defensive here. Of course, you should do check if it's actually a Boolean. But for now, we just say, OK, we know it's Boolean because our type system has already verified that we expect Boolean here. And actually, I think Java does um, automatic unwrapping. And so we can do Boolean condition, right? So this is the evaluated condition. And now we can simply say if, you know, if our if then else thing is true, else do something else. Well, what do we do in the in the case where the condition is true, well, we return the evaluation of the done part. And otherwise, we return the evaluation of the uh, unders part. right? And this just calls recursively the interpreter for whatever expression is already there. And um, I think this should work. OK. So. It works for the, then ca for, the, for the 10 case, but not for the other one. And that's just because I seem to have put an S here, which shouldn't be there. So now it works. OK, so we've implemented structure, syntax, type system, semantics in whatever, 15 minutes, including IDE support. 
and including or well making this a modular extension of an existing language. We didn't touch the existing language at all. We've put that into a separate module. You could even do this if your existing language were only available as a binary, right? A compiled plugin. So this really allows language modularity in, in the same way and also by the way with the same patterns as object-oriented programming. Very useful. That's um, how we build many of our DSLs, by building them on top of existing, mostly kernel F abstractions. All right, surprisingly, I'm still on time. Let's go back to the slides. Come on. So there are other language workbenches, of course. There is uh, Spoofax uh, from Delft. There is um, Rascal from Amsterdam, like around the corner, CWI. Both of them are... Um, mostly intended for academic stuff. They do really interesting things, but I'm not sure they would even suggest to use it in, like, in practice without some connection to the developers. Maybe they would say that, I don't know, but they don't, it's mostly used for research. Um, then there is Xtext, which you might have heard about, which is uh, an Eclipse-based textual language workbench. That's where I started my textual modeling career after I kind of suffered from UML and other stuff. Um, it's nice, but MPS is better. And then there is uh, the whole platform, um, which can only be used in Italy. Uh, at least it is only used in Italy. The tool is by Italians, and uh, I don't know. I've never seen it used outside of Italy, so I guess it's not an option. It's an interesting tool. Um, there is a paper we wrote in 2013 uh, that compares various language workbenches. You might want to check this out and, and get a kind of objective comparison. Of course, the various paragraphs of the different tools were written by the developers of these tools, so whatever objective means. But uh, it got accepted in a reasonably reputable journal, so it must be scientific. All right, a few lessons learned. First of all, the language is not enough, right? You need, of course, a language, but then you need a good IDE. Without an IDE, languages just aren't useful, in my opinion and experience. And that's also why many of the internal DSLs aren't really useful for non-programmers, because the IDE doesn't know anything about it. Sure, you can write an IDE plugin and a compiler plugin and somehow mash this all together, but that's much more work than doing it with a dedicated language workbench. Um, analyses, good error messages, really useful. You can really piss off your users if you just have, you know, symbol not found style error messages. Not good. Um, refactorings. There is some, uh, a thing such as uh, refactoring insurance contracts. This makes sense to kind of product lineify an existing contract, so you should provide these things. But then also testing. If you're an insurance guy who specifies new insurance products, you want to test it because you don't want to be responsible if your company loses millions because you have an arithmetic bug in your contract, right? And it's actually not a challenge to convince domain experts to become test-driven. They, they really want this. And of course, you want advanced features like debuggers, animators, simulators, stuff like that. Influences on the language design. In addition to, of course, the domain structure and the notation that appeals to the people in the domain, you have to take into account things like tool capabilities, like if your tool can't do graphical editors, like Xtext, you can't do it, or you have to somehow put GMF into the whole story. You have to uh, make sure you don't um, overstress your users. Like, if you want to have a language with uh, inheritance and contracts and, uh, I don't know, template method patterns and polymorphic dispatch, and you try to sell that to insurance experts, it's going to be a tough sell because these more abstract software engineering kind of things are not mm, easily communicated. Stuff like that, right? And then there is also a matter of style, as you can clearly see from this uh, well-designed slide. Um, languages can just be ugly. Like, if you mix COBOL style and Lisp style, probably not a good idea, right? So there is some, yeah, it's a matter of taste and experience. So how to make people precise, right? How do you make non-programmers do this, like write code in all these DSLs I've shown? And the first thing you should do is you should uh, convince them that uh, expressing yourself precisely in terms of the domain is not programming, right? Programming is all about these illities. The other thing is just writing a precise specification. Sure, you use something like functions or variable definitions, but, you know, this is your first propaganda challenge. You have to 
convince people about that if they aren't convinced already. And then the other thing is you have to do some training. So we're actually writing right now a tutorial to, con to teach these really fundamental ideas of programming like expressions, types, references, functions, parameters, stuff like that, to teach this very slowly and methodically to non-programmers. We start from Excel, because everybody knows Excel, and we kind of build on that. Uh, it's an open source effort. If you want to join and help, uh, very welcome. And we use that to kind of lay the groundwork for the domain experts um, to then be able to understand uh, and use the particular DSL. Generally about skills, right? My organization doesn't know how to build languages. We've never used MPS and also it's rocket science because language engineering is computer science. I already didn't understand it when I was at university, right? That's what you hear. So the first uh, reply is, well, there's all these other new things you have no clue about, right? So what do you do? Well, you build the skills. You hire people, you get consultants, you, you, you buy knowledge, whatever. Not different here, right? And um, the other thing I say, which is not on the slide, is that tools like MPS, again, while they have their quirks, they make language engineering, it's not, it's not really computer science anymore, it's software engineering. It, it's, it's just something you do, it's like you build a framework, right? It's, it's just a different thing you build. And everybody who has some meta, you know, thinking in their head can do that. Is this the next legacy system? I motivated this talk, uh, among other things, by trying to get rid of a particular implementation technology. Are we now just you know, burying all of this stuff inside weird tools like MPS? This is a valid question. Um, I, think, I think no, and let me explain why. So here's the scenario. We have uh, a language workbench, in this case MPS, and a version one of a language, and we generate that to some kind of runtime, let's say Java code, okay? Now let's say your language changes, the language definition changes. What do you do with your existing models you have? Well, MPS supports language versioning and automatic migration of existing models. So you can meaningfully evolve your language over time, even if you already have models in the wild and you can't touch them for explicit manual migration, right? The tool does that. So now the next scenario is what do you do if your runtime changes? If you go from Java to TypeScript because you have to put it into the browser, well, you just write a new generator. That isn't always totally trivial. And in very rare cases, it's not possible because you have some weird construct here you can't map to your target without a huge performance impact. That does happen sometimes, but it's very rare. Usually, you just invest a few months of writing a generator, and these few months really don't count if you have man or person years put into your domain-specific models, right? It's not a very big investment. And then, of course, question number three is what happens if you go from MPS to whatever new kid on the block language workbench? How do you migrate that? And there the answer is a little bit more abstract, but you know your language. You have defined it. You know the structure. You know the semantics. And you have everything as a kind of formal instance of that data model. So you can always migrate it to the same language defined in a new technology. Like you export some kind of XML here and you import it here. You know the semantics. There is nothing lost. There is no burying in Java code. It's not, it's not like you can't reverse engineer what it means. This is a, it's maybe hard to appreciate from this like abstract slide, but this is a huge difference. You don't lose anything, right? And we've done this. Example, Dutch tax agency. They have migrated all of their tax rules from their proprietary system into MPS. They've also migrated the tests, and they have run all the existing tests against the new implementation until everything worked. So this is possible without a prohibitive effort. And that's really, that really is a difference to coding this stuff in Java and putting it into an EJB or something. So the answer is no. So how does all of this relate to Agile? That's another thing I hear, right? Well, we do Agile stuff here, we do DDD, we give our classes names that correspond to the domain, that's good enough. I think that's total nonsense. Um, so let me uh, point out how this looks. So there are two scenarios. Scenario one, you have one project in which you develop a language and some other code that uses the language in the same project, right? And then the other scenario is you already 
have, you, you have a project that develops the language, and then you have many projects that use the language. Like you build this, I don't know, insurance language in your company, and then you have different you know, health insurance, uh, 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 life insurance, and other insurance that use that language. So let's see how that uh, works, oops, sorry, in terms of process. Now in the first case, this language development inside your project is just exactly as if you were developing a framework or library or a platform, like some basic artifacts that other parts of your project use. There's nothing different, except you use a different tool. So I don't feel I have to say anything else. It's, it's, it's the same thing. So in the other case, where you have this one project to build the language and the other projects to use the language, well, here it's just like a dependency on some third-party thing, right? If you use whatever package from the web, that might change at some point, and you have to import that. You have to decide, do I use the new package version, and you have to migrate. Same thing here. If your language team develops a new version of the language, they give it a new version, they publish it in some kind of artifact thing, right, repository, and you decide if you want to use it. And the good thing is, if they do it right, the new language version ships with migration scripts. So this is actually something that's easier than changing a library, because libraries and frameworks do not ship with migration scripts. Languages do, or at least can, right? So this isn't something that makes you less agile. And then, of course, uh, number three, once you have defined your language, and now you have a DSL where, where, where insurance people can define and test and experiment with new product definitions themselves in real time without a lengthy you know, let's implement this manually. This is what actually enables business agili agility. I think there is no other technology that, that, that allows you to do that in this way. So there, I don't even understand the question. Um, and then the language definition itself, you have seen how little code I had to write to implement this if thing. Um, of course, for more semantically rich languages, it can be more work. But still, um, I have this quote from one of my customers, like, I've opened MPS and, and looked at the language definition. I was wondering where the code was, because he only saw these, like, five things, you know, the, the structure, the editor, the type system, and the interpreter. And he was wondering, you know, where's the actual meat? And there isn't any, because that's all you have to do. So once you master MPS, which is, admittedly, quite a bit of a learning curve, um, you have a very powerful tool at your hand on the kind of meta level. And the way I develop languages literally is I sit together with a domain expert, code a little language, turn around the laptop and let them try it out. I do this for like an hour, like the iteration is one hour. Understand a bit about the domain, build a bit of language, let them try out. I do this three or four times in a day, and then I go home and clean things up. You know, sometimes you take shortcuts here. You know. And next day I come back, or a few days later. And so it's an extremely agile process. In fact, building a language, in my opinion, is the best way to understand a domain. Because in contrast to just drawing UML diagrams that represent domain concepts, you can actually play with this and instantiate it, which is much more useful than just pictures. All right, what about continuous integration? Well, just like always, right? So you let your domain expert understand the world, write the models, run the test in the language workbench directly. Then you somehow commit this onto some kind of I'm done branch. And there, on the build server, you run the same tests. If they fail, you go back to here. Then you generate on the build server, for example, the Java representation of your code. And you also generate the tests. And then you run the tests again on the generated code. So this is how you align the semantics of the interpreter and your generator if you have sufficient tests as useful as usual. And then once you've generated the artifacts, you combine that with whatever framework code you have, create some kind of deployment package, and go to staging and then to live deployment. All of this is no different than any other automated development step. MPS can be run from the command line, you know, no, no problem. Well, actually, a bit of a problem, because the way to set this up is a bit annoying. Um, like just in terms of the details you have to configure, but otherwise this works well. We have all our languages, all our customer projects, all running on CI, as you would expect. So this brings us to the wrap-up. I have a few more things I want to mention. One, I have another session tomorrow. Somebody else uh, dropped out, so I'm the kind of replacement speaker in the blockchains track, and I'm going to talk not really about blockchains, but about how to actually implement contracts, like as in real contracts, um, with or without blockchains. And I, of course, use a bit of DSL here. So if you're interested in this, you might want to join this. Same time tomorrow, a different room. 
Um, also, there is another paper that I want, you to, want to point you to. We have captured, so as I uh, told you, we've implemented this embedder thing, right, these extensions to C for years, and we have written a 46-page paper where we discuss in painstaking detail all the good and bad experiences we've had doing this, uh, like things like performance, learnability of MPS, everything you can think of. So this is a, I think, relatively objective account of um, maybe one of the biggest DSL development projects out there, certainly with MPS. Also, I don't know of, of another tool that built a similar ecosystem of languages. So this is, I think, a really good um, kind of reality check of what, what can be done with these tools. All right, wrap up. Separation of concerns is key, right? Separate Fachlichkeit from technology. Otherwise, you'll step into the legacy trap. Um, DSLs can do that. Um, they completely separate Fachlichkeit from technical concerns. Um, they can help integrate domain experts into the development process directly if you build the languages in a way where you can at least do pair programming between a technical guy and a domain expert. And over time, they'll do it alone, right? Um, language workbenches is what enables DSLs. You should not open up whatever IDE and start doing this from scratch, like building your own parser and doing everything from scratch. It's just too much work. And finally, um, DSLs, DSLs aren't in conflict with Agile. Um, you just have to uh, you know, think about how you're going to approach it. All right, uh, I'm done. Questions? You have to ask questions because I finished five minutes before the talk ended. Now you have to ask questions. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I uh, very much enjoyed the talk. I will definitely look into MPS right now. Thanks. Um, I can remember a long time ago, I was knee deep in uh, Common Lisp and uh, Clos, and back then I was thinking about um, something that you call pre projections editors. I was wondering um, the if then else statement that you just made. Can you actually change the editor right now, or maybe, maybe it takes a bit more time, um, to allow you to project even this if then else construction in the editor differently? So, yeah. for example, my cursor commands might change depending on whether I'm in the expression or not. I don't know what you mean by cursor commands, but... Well, for example, the mathematical uh, expression would yeah. have to change the cursor commands if you want to go and skip down over a bar yeah. or something you like that. You can even have uh, palettes where you can drag and drop in mathematical symbols. Um, yeah. I can even build several editors for the same concept and make them switchable so every user can select their own editor. Um, yeah. So one thing, I didn't say that, but one thing that changed, I mean, projectional editors have been experimented with in the 70s and 80s. Mm -hmm. um, but the difference from back then to now is that the editors you define now are actually usable. Like, you can, most of the things you can just type linearly and not building the tree explicitly, which nobody, like, you don't want to enter plus five, three, right? You want to type five plus three. And this, this ability actually rests on, a, on an extension of MPS we built. It's called Grammar Cells. Uh, it's also open source in this extension repository. And this allows you, with very little effort, to build editors that are very close to text editors for textual notations. And of course, if you have non-textual notations like tables or math symbols, well, then you have buttons and stuff because you can't type. I mean, it, and nobody expects to be able to type because that's not how you interact with these things. Very cool. I will really check it out. Thank you very much. Anybody else? That's it. Okay. Thank you very much.